Okay. The, this is the, the sad part of the talk. Until a few days ago, we were discussing together with Paolo how to, how to organize this original one hour uh, talk shared with me uh, and, uh, and uh, Maurizio. Uh, I, Paolo is not here. I decided to, to take somehow his voice, uh, disclosing that my training is completely different. So I will present some of the results that are still preliminary. Unfortunately, now it's too late, but uh, we will be a part of a published paper soon, hopefully, with the help of the other uh, people at the ESS uh, computational group. Uh, I'm uh, at the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology in Sapienza. <clears throat> uh, I will... Uh, uh, talk today about the, as you see, premotor cortex, introducing somehow the uh, working collaboration with the Maurizio and Paolo. And uh, also I'll try to explain to you why it's important in, in our opinion to study motor decision, why it's relevant. Uh, first slides show uh, the homology between uh, the human brain that is about 1.5 kilogram, and the brain of the model that we are used to play with. That is 100 grams, still with uh, six billion neurons. So we, we know that this system is complex. There's nothing to say more. But I would like to start from the pillar that were, were mentioned at the beginning of the new, uh, Road of the Centro Fermi, interdisciplinarity and complexity. When I, I graduated in medicine, 1990, I graduated with a thesis on this small part of the brain of a, of a macaca mulatta to try to relate the activity recorded with a single electrode in many different days to the behavior. What is today in the textbook of medicine and uh, uh, also for neurologists available after 30 years is still what it was available at that time. What it was known at that, why is that? Because if the brain is complex, it's complex to study, it's complex to report, it's probably it's complex to finalize in the, in the last available theory ready to be transmitted. But there is another uh, important uh, uh, issue that is interdisciplinarity. And uh, uh, we were uh, some, uh, somehow delayed on the, uh, on the way to explain uh, complexity because of the complexity, but also because of the uh, uh, availability of uh, the right instruments. I remember that in the 1990, we were still using the PDP-11. I don't know if you, are, if you remember it. With the possibility to record probably few events, not for sure what from the brain is produced. So this is the reason why historically the brain was studied first as a representation based on simple events that are the spikes. But today we know that this is not sufficient. And interdisciplinarity also provided all us not only instrumental tools, but also other way to look at the same data. And this, I think, is the power of the of the interdisciplinarity in the in the neuroscience field. So, what uh, uh, if if we we stuck with an electrode in a, a part of the brain, whatever part of the brain? We know that there are a lot of neurons around. So the density that is computed in the rat hippocampus is that there are at least 300,000 neurons for millimeter cube. Are we are able to describe the activity or even the dynamics of this uh, population of neurons? The answer is no, for many reasons. Some of them that uh, I, of the, are those that I reported before, but the other, is technically based. If I put this electrode in this part of the brain, I will have the possibility to extract single unit activity, 
within a small range, that is a volume of about 50 microns of radius, but the, the remaining part will be not accessible with this method. Uh, let, let's move it over here for a while. This is what the, really the, the electrode is recording. Uh, I have to anticipate it that uh, conversely to what was proposed uh, in most of the talk at preceding, we are behavioral neurophysiologists, meaning that we use a behavior as a probe for the system. So we control behavior very accurately. And then, uh, for example, we ask our animal to perform a movement as the one that you see here in a touch screen. The animal is starting from a position and when the target is, uh, is presented, its goal to receive the reward is just to move the arm toward the target. When the target is touched, the reward is provided. And you see here what this electrode is able to extract from the very small part of the very large brain we still have uh, in our uh, hand, that is the monkey brain. A series of uh, signal, this is the field potential, with very different temporal scales. They are slow ones and very fast. Just to, to report for those of, of you that are not familiar with the, this temporal scale, the spike of uh, uh, the action potential of a, of a, of a unit is as a duration of our, about one millisecond. So the very rapid signal and the very rapid change in the voltage are the action potential. So the final output of the neuron that are considered specialized cell able to depolarize. But the, the remaining part are signal that are there as a result of the integration of the many inputs that the neurons in this small portion of the brain are receiving. And the word uh, neuroscience, uh, electrophysiology is used to do traditionally is to bypass the signal in order to remove the slower components that actually are very close to the signal that we are able then to record by fMRI as uh, was re remembered to us this morning. And uh, with different methods so like uh, putting a threshold uh, based on the amount of voltage, we do extract the time when the action potential appeared in time. And uh, what you see here in the top right is a typical example of a neuron recorded in the premotor area while the animal is making a movement like the one represented here. The, the, the movement is never the same. If I ask yourself to, to push a button following a sound for 1000 times, your reaction time, so, so your time to react to the sound will be never the same. So you will have a distribution of a variable response. This is why you see the movement onset here well uh, evident, while the go, so the time when the target was presented is variable. And uh, every line here presented is a trial. So one monkey, one movement, one neuron measured for many time. And what we see is what was uh, available in the 90, in the book uh, uh, still there, that uh, motor areas are acting before movement generation. If you, in fact, if you see before the movement, there is an increase of activity that is preceding the movement tones. But there are other way to look at the same activities. Uh, again, this same electrode over here, uh, measuring this low and fast component after the high pass could be transformed by, a, uh, let's say a power, a spectral de derivative of the initial signal as uh, better described by Mathieu del Judic years ago as a good representation of the local firing rate. So what you see here in the right is now aligned to the go target appearance, many trials. And every time you see the relative power of the signal in the higher part of the spectrum, that is a good representation of the firing rate. Of course, here we are recording single unit. In this case, we are approximating the volume that is close to the electrode. But the, the, 
the overall message is the same. Before the movement, there is an increase of power of firing rate that is preceding, anticipating, causing the movement. Well, this, elect, this uh, figure over here on the left is proposing the same signal than before, expressed voltage and time, now in a logarithmic scale, reported as a power of different frequency bands. So you see the slow bands aligned to the time of target presentation, the moment onset, the end of movement, at the time of reward. And there are a power suggesting that the different bands are contributing with different entities at the, to the behavior that we are observing. So this, that, that very small part of the brain has this kind of dynamics, very variable ongoing. But what is interesting in the, in the figure is that uh, this lower part is reporting the single unit recorded from the same electrode. So if the experimenter, as in the 90, was just collecting the group of single units, the final message was uh, the population of neurons acting in that, that area are somehow involved in a movement. But now we know that when there might be this neuron is discharging, there are other elements active, slow, slow elements are uh, the uh, changes in the membrane potential of the neurons that are receiving input. Before the input is, tra is transformed in the spike, the membranes are uh, opening channels and therefore they are uh, the neurons uh, with the, the members of the neurons are, uh, they are opening channels that change the local field. And this is a very slow effect. But you see here that the, 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 the slow and fast signals are both complementary, and, and all, but also carrying, having the power to carry very different signals that we have no a simple way to extract. So while it's true that the, we are able to describe that there is a link between the synaptic input to, and the spike up to output, what is going on in the local processing of even of a very small part of the brain is still unknown. Uh, now it's the turn of why is it, uh, are you going to tell me five minutes before? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, uh, okay. More than 10 minutes. All right, uh, why, the, why we are interested to motor decision? Because motor decision and the behavior that we are controlling had, uh, has a different components and all of us to, to probe the system with conflicting signals. For example, the conflicting signal is that uh, I'm here now, I have to decide right or left. So conflicting are left or right direction, or I'm ready to start to a stop signal, waiting for the green, but then there is an ambulance uh, approaching. I have to decide if it's the right moment to push the engine or not, the gas. Well, motor area are active before movement generation. We already say that, but uh, sorry, but uh, with the different, uh, let's say, implementation of the task that I just described to you in the previous slide, that is just asking the animal to respond to target presented to the, to the periphery of the, of the workspace, for example, by, by having a, a, a functional instruction that say, okay, now you know that there are two potential targets. After, by a queue, I will tell you which one of the two were the, your right target. And what we know is that in the premotor cortex and many other areas, both decisions are available there before, after a very rapid change, one is selected and the other one is canceled. So we are interested to this dynamics because we believe that uh, by describing the the, the, the way how the neurons contribute to motor solution is a good way to, to look at the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the way how the brain works and the neurons interact each other. Uh, recently, as I said, I started in the 1990s studying the motor system, but, but recently since the, let's say the two, two, 2006, we are studying a different version of the task that I'm going here to present also because it will be part of the Maurizio talk. 
so the this is the upper part is the standard uh, trial. So most of the time, the, the monkey just see the peripheral target appearing, sometime on the right, other time on the left. It is uh, target is to respond to the target presentation's goal in order to receive the reward. In a smaller percentage of the trials, there is a, 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 a new event, the ambulance. The stop signal is presented while you are ready to start with your gas. And the stop signal is asking to cancel the planet movement. Why is very interesting this uh, 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 behavioral paradigm? Because it's very well described behaviorally. It all of predictions. And the predictions are here in the upper right panel described in the sense that there is a model that say that when the target is presented with a variability that is the same of the reaction time that I described to you before, the neural activity or whatever process is, is supposed to, to start and go to a threshold that then favor the initiation of the movement. When the stop signal is presented to the ambulance later, there is another process that is going to contrast the previous one. But the possibility that the rest is in favor of the first of the second depends on the slope of the preparatory activity. So if this is a very late uh, process, it will be very easy to stop. So if, if I know that there is an ambulance every day on the same uh, crossway, I will be react or no, statistically slower than the other part of the city. And this will allow us uh, to, to be more efficient when the ambulance will be presented. So this is es essentially explained in the inhibition function that say that accordingly to the distance between the go and the stop signal, that is this stop signal delay during the reaction time, the probability to respond, it's a function of this distance. Will be very easy or very difficult to stop. I, I, I could play with this, uh, 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 symbols provided as information to the animal and at the, at, the less, at, the, at the hand provided as information to probe the system that I'm studying, that is the portion of the brain that is the premotor cortex. What we know? We know, looking at the single neural activity, that uh, when the activity in the premotor cortex that I described to you before is racing, it, it, it is racing as, the, as expected in most of the neurons and uh, is moving toward the hypothetical threshold, even if the threshold is still largely discussed. When the, in red, a stop signal is presented, the possibility that uh, this, the, the animal is canceling the movement emerge when the activity diverge from the previous one. This is a single neuronal case. And uh, we, we provided a, a series of evidence that uh, are here listed. But things are more complex where we move in another uh, dimensional scale, that is the special scale. What you see here is uh, not anymore one electrode recording from uh, the premotor cortex, but 96 at the same time. It's, it's still a very small part of the brain, but the, the complexity is emerging. There are uh, population that are more active in during the stop than during the go process, the inverse of what I generally presented to you as a, a, the expected behavior of these neurons. So how is possible to extract message from this complicated system? Uh, one way that is now largely uh, and uh, quite uh, commonly presented as a, as a tool is to adopt principal component analysis. And by the 96 initial components that are uh, uh, based on the electrode that are uh, used for record, the uh, data are organized in a, in a new subspace that is essentially looking for the co right combination of features. And what you see here is the dynamics of this population now expressed in the first three principal components mm -hmm. And with the same behavioral point, key points that I present to you before, the go signal, the initial movement, and the reward. 
for the stop trials that here are presented in red, sorry, in green, I apologize for the change in color, uh, the, the, the stop signal presentation correspond to a dynamics that is completely different of the normal trial here in Chan, no stop named, or when the animal was unable to cancel after the stop presentation because its race of the neuron in the premotor cortex was too rapid. So you see here that the dynamic is very similar for a good part till the moment of processing uh, for the correct and wrong movement trials. For both the correct movement and the stop correct trials, they converge to a reward state. And the states for the moment is different from the states of the holding. So this representation, starting from the very previous one, very complex, let me say again, is providing uh, evidence that this portion of the brain is working to provide uh, the internal representation of the information for solving the task as a, a mixture of states that could be used differently according to the behavior of the, that the, to the animal is required. T together with Paolo, and actually uh, mainly thanks to Paolo um, and uh, uh, Gabriel Baglietto, we uh, approach it to the same complexity with a different method of uh, uh, complexity reduction that is the, that uh, actually uh, Guido presented briefly this morning. It's, uh, the idea is, is very simple. Given the here are, are only one type of trial present, let's say that the trial when the mo monkey is always moving. A trial is from the time when the target is presented to the time when the reward is provided. And uh, we have uh, the same trial for the 90C channel. This allows us to have a, a, a feature vector that could be represented in a space. There are many feature vectors in time and the algorithm that is this uh, uh, state space clustering is trying to find the proximity rule in a way to define a cluster as the uh, uh, average location of uh, uh, feature vectors that are more similar each other. Th there is no time anymore at the end because if I have my recording uh, uh, so, 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 uh, provided to the to the clustering system, there will be at the end labels. So it will be every time the same the similar label will, was uh, found, and, and this is represented with a with a threshold to be part of a cluster. So if I substitute this to to whatever other code, my initial neural activity will be a sequence of states. Here, feature vectors. The magic thing is that uh, if I now I now go back to the to the task. May put a question sure. about it because uh, this is very interesting. Uh, this clustering method. How this method depends on n? Because you know, when you have a large n, maybe that some of the neurons are not uh, important. They mix the the clusters, so maybe there is an optimal n. So you mean how much, how much this depends of the number on the of, number N. I, I suppose it, so it, maybe, it is a straight uh, relation with, but uh, I, I don't know if Guido will comment. Or later, later, later you can comment at but, the end. Uh, uh, for my, my view, I expect that the, the answer is yes. So uh, the, the, the vector to be discriminated as a different need to be uh, complex per se. So based in a higher N. Yes, microphone many, many of the same trial huh? so uh, the, the, the the network uh, in, the, in the network space is visited several several times and you can consider that this is uh, every time a different realization and then you have a lot of samples in the same place of, of, of course oh. I mean, Sorry. If there is a fraction of neurons working completely independently on the others, they will mix the features. No, no. What, what's it, what is Even it? if you repeat many, many times. <laughs> but the, the, the sampling time is also important because if we, are, we are sampling the signal every five milliseconds. So you will have the way to, to statistically prove maybe also with the less valid N that the, that cluster is still 
a valid one because of the repetition of the same in time. So, but uh, let me go in. So the, what, what I was uh, uh, telling you before is that the time is not there anymore after clustering, but still the labels that now are color, not anymore A, B, C, D, could be used to tag every, uh, let's say, uh, every appearance of the, of the, of the uh, vector pertaining to a cluster, so every cluster in time. And what you see here is the time of moment onset, preceding, preceded now by the original 96 channel recorded activity, now expressed as different clusters in time. The, 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 there are different aspects that could be very uh, well discussed. I will skip this part because of the, uh, this are, is the Z score of the Logumia Mua that suggested that actually there are traveling waves uh, during the, this, uh, this dynamic. To, to, to show you that there are, uh, for example, cluster that this are, is uh, moving to the right, this is moving to the left. So that all of the trials on the left sorted, labeled with the cluster, activity now transformed uh, thanks to this new formal representation. And when the animal is moving to the right, there is a first cluster that is uh, different of the cluster that is uh, expressed by the same population when the animal is moving to the left. And please note that this first cluster is aligned uh, even with different time to the target, suggesting a causality between the two. Why I'm suggesting to look at this causality? Because then when I move close to the moment onset, you see that the cluster are aligned to the moment onset. Uh, to the point that uh, I could try to, to conclude that uh, the moment cl locked clusters are those that uh, are representing the motor plan completion that in other forms were expressed by the increased the neural activity of the single neuron before the moment generation. But now we have a more uh, detailed and uh, let's say uh, uh, fully expressed uh, uh, way to, 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 to look at the population around the left. No, not more. The, uh, the, the, this idea of having this cluster signaling the motor, the motor plan maturation allow us also to, to do predictions. See here, these uh, pink orange clusters are uh, not expressed or expressed when the stop is a error or is a success. Suggesting that uh, essentially, if I don't allow the system to go on that state that I'm able to express by the algorithm as a state space with these two cluster, when the stop signal is presented, remember that the, signal, the stop signal is presented with different delay during the different trial, the animal will be the one, the, the animal will succeed or not. So the, but just looking at the neural activity, I'm able to explain the behavior or to predict the behavior very well, very in advance of the stop signal presentation. Uh, this sequence, uh, of course, suggests uh, also other aspects that there is a metastability. And uh, together with Paolo, with a uh, never handed, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, part of the, of the work, we asked, uh, are these transition over here uh, the manifestation of attractor hopping? There are different ways to, to investigate the, this issue. And one is to look at the dispersion of the, of, the, of the neural activity. Here, label it again with cluster. You see that as others, we, we noted that uh, neural activity has different minima during the trial. One of this is the time preceding the moment onset. Other are the time of target presentation. And here not shown is also, there is another minimum for, with the, when the target is presented. But, uh, uh, the, the, our conclusion was that uh, to anticipate that not all, all of the minima in the neural activity dispersion are, essen, are, are the expression of uh, actor dynamics. And the way we investigated that is by using different measures of the flow in the configuration of, of space of the neural activity. One is measuring how parallel are the average velocity of the, of the flow and also the dispersion. To go briefly on this uh, part, because of the time, we see that when the minimum of the movement onset uh, 
and the minimum of the ghost signal are compared to the dispersion and the cosine of the vectors, you observe very different uh, features. In one case, uh, the suggested uh, expression is probably attractor-based. In, an, in another time, it's not because the velocity uh, are parallel uh, each other and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and they are actually also too close. So to, to conclude, uh, I hope to, to, that I demonstrated to you that uh, neuron in premotor cortex participated to the motor control with an heterogeneous contribution that uh, with uh, using the, the one of the possible approach, but both the principal components and the cluster analysis show different aspects, but uh, always in the same direction, metastability is clearly evident in the system. Unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, but the attractor-based dynamics is only observed in some phase of this task. We speculated that the, this is, could be due to, diff to the different input that we are not considering that the, the, the network is receiving in the different part of the, of the task. Uh, and so uh, thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much, Stefano. Question. There is time for one question. Is there a, another question? Federico? So just to, to check uh, if I understood that the, the, the multiple actors in the uh, PCA uh, decomposition were on the premotor cortex. Mm. So essentially, it looks like uh, in the premotor cortex uh, are more similar the patterns uh, between success and success even if there is motion or not, then motion with motion, uh, if uh, one is successful and the other not. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the trajectory that is jumping up is a motion trajectory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but this, uh, in this case, there is an error. Yeah, there is an error, but we are in the promoter cortex. So already in the promoter cortex, uh, the trajectories are more similar uh, if uh, the movement is correct, then if there is movement, I, I, uh, ah, this cluster over here that I have not mentioned it, it only ap appear when the error is there. So also in premotor cortex, there is a strong signal for error. Yeah. It's also evident here, you're right. Okay, let's thank again Stefan and let's move thank to you. the second part of the talk by Maurizio Mattia of the Instituto Superiore di Sanità for the theoretical and computational counterpart. Okay. All right, so moving a few steps from what Stefano told us, I'm going to show you what, what, what we can say. Maybe you can hear me better if I move, remove the, what we can say when we have a, a kind of brain state transition. And a, a typical brain state transition we have usually uh, in, uh, in our brain is from uh, the experience, uh, uh, the everyday life experience of each of us. No, every day we are awake and we are uh, 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 fall asleep. And uh, this is uh, uh, something in, in which we are in a two different uh, also behavioral conditions. So when we are awake, we are conscious. When we are uh, uh, sleeping, we are unconscious. And these uh, two dramatically different uh, uh, condition, behavioral conditions are actually are associated in uh, cortical networks uh, uh, to very different patterns of activity. And an example is shown here where you can see this is a classic work paper by Mr. Steriade, which for the first, was the first to study what's happening in the brain when you are awake and when you are moving to uh, sleep. And you see that when, when the, in this cat looking at the single cell is awake, 
the discharge of the single cell is rather irregular and a relatively high fire rate, as you see here. But also, if you have a look to another area, so no, like, like, like this. But once you move up uh, and you look at the system at the uh, larger uh, scales, you see that the electroencephalography signal, like this one, is uh, also more regular. But when the cat falls asleep, the, uh, at both this level, the activity of the brain is changing dramatically. You start to see at the single neuron level Level, that there are phases in which the neuron is uh, highly hyperpolarized, completely silent, and then start to have a jump and uh, new spikes are produced at a relatively high fire rate. So you are moving, the neuron moves from a kind of down state to an up state, down state or an up state. And this is a, a rhythm. Uh, at uh, about one hertz that you express all of us and uh, many animals uh, are expressing invariantly at one hertz. This is also visible at the level of the EEG. So, so this is the scalp EEG is a, a lamp signal. And uh, you see that there is an alternation between uh, a big deflection of the local free potential and uh, high uh, frequency components. And then a uh, large deflection, high frequency component corresponding to the up states. Oh, these slow oscillations, are, as I told you, are a hallmark of, uh, of this, uh, uh, this synchronized state. And uh, you will see why this is, uh, I call it uh, synchronized. So in some way, we have some desynchronization of the firing when we are awake, and we have a synchronized with a synchronous rhythm uh, expressed by single cell, but also for, uh, for, by, by uh, uh, pool of neurons, okay? And in model, this can be uh, in, uh, in spiking neural networks, can be uh, well described all the feature that you can observe in this rhythm by a relaxation oscillator. You see here that a, a spiking neural network uh, can express the same alternation between up state. So let, have a look to the blue, to the blue trace, which is the multi-unit activity uh, uh, taught uh, by uh, Stefano. And then you can find here the down state up, down, low, low, high firing, low firing, high firing, low firing. And if you have a look now to another degree of freedom, the red one is another uh, state variable of the same system, which is expressing the level of adaptation. So the level of fatigue that these network, these neurons are expressing. So whenever a neuron fires, it is fatigued. And this fatigue in some way acts as a self inhibition. It's trying to reduce the excitability in order to prevent to have neurons firing too much. And this uh, uh, bouncing between a, 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 a relatively highly excitable system and a, a, a relatively low excitable system explains the, uh, this alternation between up and down states as a relaxation oscillator, because you are moving, these are the null clients of this uh, uh, oscillator where we have these two state variables which are the firing rate, nu, and the adaptation variable, first sort of equation that can be worked out uh, relying on a dynamic field theory on spike in neural networks and uh, that we are, many, many of us are studying and uh, have a, a state dependent uh, time scales and uh, to which also uh, uh, Gianni uh, Vinci is contributing with his uh, PhD here. And uh, again, it's, uh, you can have this alternation as uh, jumping from one preferred state to another preferred state. So the, the, this self-inhibition is shaping a kind of an energy landscape, right? like, like, shown, like, like is shown here. Okay, you can work out relying on this mean field description, mean field theory, or the, the phase diagram of this kind of system, okay? And the phase diagram is again uh, well described by mainly two degree, two, two main parameters. So the one parameter is the uh, excitation of this network, which is on the x-axis, the level of excitation. You can uh, interpret this as uh, how strong are the excited synapses, or how strong is the input coming from other areas. Okay, this is the x-axis. The y-axis is the level of adaptation. How much a neuron is fatigued when it fires a lot. And you can change this intensity. And when you have a look to the different phases this kind of networks are able to produce, you find these two intriguing uh, regions that we studied also with uh, Guido Gigante and Paolo some times ago. And uh, we see that there is a, a condition in which there is this slow rhythm, slow oscillations, okay? And there are two regions, the white regions, where you have only one fixed point, a stable fixed point. This is very, this is a yellow region is representative of the slow oscillations that you see at the single cell assembly level during sleep or under anesthesia. And this other 
white region is the one where you have a stable focus, and this is represented by uh, it is representing uh, this uh, the synchronized activity uh, that you observe during wakefulness. So whenever you move from uh, this part, you see that the network is almost silent. Then moving backwards, so reducing the adaptation, you start to see bursts of activity, up states, very long downs. This is a, a rather stochastic system. And then you will see in the middle, rather regular slow oscillation, up and down, up and down, up and down. This is the non run slip, okay? So it very, although this cell assembly model is really simple, you can capture a lot of the feature you observe in vivo. And when you move crossing these boundaries, this critical point, actually you start to see the, the stable focus. No, you see the, the, the synchronized activity at a high firing rate. This is the awake state. And uh, this transition is an hope for bifurcation. And uh, you have here a synchronized phase transition, okay? This is uh, uh, hypothesized to be uh, behind the transition from sleep to uh, the, the, when you approach to uh, the, the conscious state, okay. But when you consider not only a single cell assembly, actually in the brain, what is happening that you have many of these cell assembly distributed across the cortical surface. And uh, in, from this nice example of, uh, of uh, optical imaging in uh, the visual cortex of, uh, of mice, you can see that during this uh, slow readings, actually uh, cell assemblies are organized producing uh, activity patterns that are resembling waves, slow waves that can be a very uh, different different kind. There can be spiral waves, as in this case, here the color is representing the face of this uh, activity, of the rhythm, up and down, up and down, or planar waves, as in this case. For this reason, the synchronized state, the one associated to sleep, is uh, a, uh, named as a slow wave activity. Normal sleep usually is uh, named also slow wave activity. Okay, but uh, this, uh, starting from this, uh, 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 as mentioned by Miguel Munoz, uh, you can describe at the, uh, uh, in a network of spatially connected relaxation oscillators, the, uh, the same uh, synchroni synchronization phase transition in which you have traveling ways for a given critical parameter, like in this case, then you change this critical parameter that is in the end is the adaptation. You start to see that waves start to be more mixed, okay, some bubbling, and then at the end you cross the boundary follow after the crossing of this uh, critical point, and you start to see the asynchronous state in all the cell assemblies that are composing this cortical field. Okay, this is depicted in, in, in this. So this is a very similar transition we see at the single module level. But in this case, we can also have a look to how these uh, activations across the cortical field uh, are distributed. And uh, usually when you are very close to the critical point, you can observe, as discussed and, uh, by this morning by uh, Miguel, uh, to, you can observe uh, a distribution of uh, the sites a power law distribution of the size of these uh, uh, global events, okay? And uh, so we, we asked whether this is really what is happening in, in the brain, in the macaque brain, and also in the mammal brains, uh, or, uh, and also we try to understand whether this uh, critical, uh, this, this hypothesis about a critical brain is uh, uh, reasonable or uh, has some foundation. And uh, to do that, we started exactly from the same experiment described by uh, Stefano. Again, we have uh, the uh, Maka monkey uh, performing this uh, countermanding task, stop signal task. They, uh, Stefano and, and collaborators, recorded from the promoter cortex with this multi unit array. They are uh, catching uh, 96 signals simultaneously. And these 96 signals are shown here. Each row is a, a channel. And on this uh, row, you have the multi-unit activity of a single channel, so which is in a, in a specific place of this grid, okay? In this uh, blue uh, part, you see the local free potential recorded from the same uh, electrodes, but they are representing the low frequency component, okay? Now, if you have a look to the uh, sharp deflection in the local free potential, this, this uh, negative uh, local field potential peaks, you see here, this is a stereotyped example, you can detect that they are occurring in a rather random way. And uh, it has been uh, discussed by, by several, one of, one of the precursors of this discussion was uh, uh, Dietmar 
lens, uh, speaking about the, 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 the sides of occurrence of these lo negative local free potentials are uh, distributed as in a scale-free way, uh, we, we follow the, 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 the steps. And uh, you can see here, whenever we detect a negative local free potential fluctuations, we can see in the, in the mean local free potential, you can see that also the channels are contributing at the same time with a negative local free potential. I didn't tell that this is a, a work in progress that we actually, uh, it's ended, we are uh, submitted the paper and uh, uh, Antonio Pazienti in the audience is uh, the main actor of this, uh, of this uh, game, let's say. And uh, okay, so there is a distribution of these negative local free potential peaks that of course, during the performance of the task. And they are distributed. And this, is, this, is, this distribution you see is not always the same. Sometimes a channel is involved, some other side, a channel is not involved. And the sides of this, some guys told us that are, is distributed as a power law. Okay, but so let's have a look now inside the task, what is happening. Inside the task, if you now have a look to the density of these events, you can see that these events are not uniformly distributed in time. You, the, the, the distribution is shown here for the different stages of a trial. So you have many trials, you count how many log negative local free potential you have, and this is the distribution. You see, for instance, that during the uh, occurrence of uh, the, 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 the presentation of the target, almost no uh, negative local free potential are there. And there is a phase in which in the, instead there is a, a huge amount of no negative local free potential, which is here. The, this is when the animal finished its task and start to be relaxed. And after the movement, it, re it receives the, the reward and you start to see a lot of uh, uh, this negative local free potential. Okay. So maybe is there that the brain is working in a critical condition. And uh, in order to explore this, we had a look to what is happening whenever you have a negative log of potential. So we averaged locking to the tip of this negative log of, log of potential event. And we had a look also to the average around this time of the multi-unit activity. In that period, the period when the animal is relaxed between two trials. And you can see that the black curve here is showing that there is a deflection of the multi-unit activity. And then just before the uh, occurrence of this negative log of potential, you have a jump in the multi-unit activity. So there, there, there seems to be a, a causal relationship between the multi-unit activity of uh, this uh, small cell assembly around an electrode and uh, the log of potential that usually represent the synaptic input. So in some way, I'm firing and then I'm producing some synaptic into to myself and to others. And this is the reason why I will have a deflection of the local free potential. But to make the short story, the, the, the story short, you can see that, okay, we, we, there, are, there have been several criticism about the criticality estimated uh, relying only on non negative local free potential. And for this reason, we relied on a more specialized, specialized event. So this jump, in the multi-unit activity. And we found that this gentis multi-unit activity that I will call sharp upward transition, SAT, is occurring very, in a very similar way with respect to what I should before for the Nelegali log of free potential. You see, this is a, a couple of trials. This uh, color, the graded shaded uh, map is representing the multi-unit activity of each star channel in time. These are the events. And the red circle are when we are able to detect a SAT in the multi-unit activity instead of a negative log of potential. So we are speaking about not single spike of a neuron, but an activation of a cell assembly, which is a more reliable uh, uh, events. Okay, if you now have a look to how these events are, they, they are collective or, or not, you can see that indeed they are producing avalanches. And, uh, uh, and these avalanches, Yes, tell me, please. What do you mean exactly by avalanche? Okay, so we, we look for all the events that are occurring in a, in a time interval close to, uh, across all channels, close to the negative log of free potential. And we control that this negative log of free potential is far enough 
from another Nugget and Lothar Twin Financial. So it's actually, it's a chain of events that at some point stops and you will no, never see ne nor suit, neither no negative log of potential. So it's really a, a sequence of events in, in a short time interval, okay? Which is distributed across the multi-unit. Sorry, yeah, uh, it please. looks to be not only a, a power law, but a mixture between a power law and another function. Absolutely, and you're absolutely right. And I, I, will, I will go there in, in, in a second. So if now you estimate the distribution of the size of these avalanches, Looking at the negative log of field potential, you see that if I focus on the intertrial interval, so when the animal is at rest between two different trials, I and then I look at the avalanches, I am able to detect when the animal is performing the task, which here is represented by the blue uh, distribution and the cyan distribution, you see that looking only the negative log of field potential, they are almost identical. Okay, and let's say that, yes, uh, Andrea is right. Actually, there is a, a, a large, an excess of large avalanches, but have a look to this. So we, maybe this is not a critical uh, condition, but we are not so far from there, okay? But what is important is then if now you look at the avalanche size distribution, when you see this sharp upward transition of the multi-unit activity, the distribution in the resting-like period, black, and the rest of the task period, gray, these distributions are completely different. Okay, so maybe, maybe multi-unit activity, this, uh, these uh, events in the multi-unit activity are more informative with respect because are more localized. We know that local field potential are related to the synaptic input and synaptic input is a lamp signal. I'm receiving input by, by you, by you, by you. So what I see as a local field potential is the sum of many contribution. And uh, this is the criticism that has been uh, rise to this kind of estimation of avalanches. But multi-unit activity has, no, has not this problem. And you can see that now the resting period is really rather similar to a power law. Well, yes, the power law. We, we have only less than two decades. Uh, available. But uh, I, I have to confess, I'm not a supporter of criticality in the brain. Eh? So actually, uh, I have to say that, as you will see, this is, um, I, I try to convince you that actually only in a very small amount of period, you are approaching a possible critical state. But another one I want to stress you uh, is, is the following. So if now we look at the time when we have negative local field potential, if now I collect big avalanches and short avalanches, I will have two different time courses for the sharp up to transition. So large avalanches, which are the purple time series, you see have a big jump in a multi-unit activity expected, but you see the activity before this jump is relatively lower. This is important. And uh, while if you, I'm focusing on small avalanches, there is a lot of activity, a lot, a larger level of activity before the onset of this avalanche, okay? And this is, uh, in my opinion, this is a nice link on one of the talk by, by, by Lucilla, because uh, you, you will see that actually there is exactly the opposite relationship between the activity and the response. But I will talk this uh, in a few seconds. But what are these events, okay? This multi-unit activity. Well, if now we come back to the slow wave activity, so the rhythms expressed under anesthesia and uh, during sleep, you see that there is this, uh, and, and this is an example from uh, uh, Stefano recordings. In this case, the animal is anesthetized and he shows up and down, black and uh, a white period, black and white period. And uh, whenever I have a suit, actually is at the beginning of the up. If I focus on these uh, uh, events, this can be viewed as uh, an avalanche uh, once again. And you see that the fissures are very similar to the one I showed before, looking at the organization of this multi-unit activity during resting, during this resting period. Okay, so there are, there are similarities between what I am serving as the onset of the, uh, an upstate in slow wave activity and during the, an avalanche I see in the, during the intertrial interval. And the, the, the similarities are not only there because we know, as I showed you from, from the mice, that whenever you have a look in the, in the spatiotemporal organization of this uh, uh, down to up transition, 
in the uh, uh, cortex during slow wave activity, these are slow waves. And uh, this is what we, are, we have been able to record, but this is a standard uh, uh, result. So if you look at the multi-unitity uh, uh, multi on top of the grid, this is uh, uh, the direction anterior posterior, and this is medial lateral, uh, this is the grid, you see that this uh, color represents the, the, the wave fronts at different times. So there is a propagation. Mm? So this uh, up and down states actually are occurring as uh, a sequence of events, events that are traveling across the, the mare, the multi-electrode array. These are two examples because the waves are not always the same, but this also this is known. And this is a, a snapshot of what we recorded from uh, the monkey. But, so if this is the case, which is the relationship seen from the perspective of allergies of these two uh, uh, events, for, seen from the multi-unitativity. So the multi-unitativity has been never uh, inspected with this, uh, in this framework of uh, criticality and so else. What you see, and I'm, I'm going to you, uh, that actually, if now I see the distribution of the avalanche sites in these three conditions, so slow wave activity, green, uh, uh, resting like, orange and the whole the rest of the task gray you see that slow wave activity have a huge peak at very large uh, avalanche size why because again whenever there is an up state this up state involve all the multi electrode array okay so this is uh, a, a, let's say a, a subcritical region in the in, in the framework of this synchronization phase transition whenever you are in this resting like state you see that the distribution of avalanche size start to be more similar to the power law with the exponent minus three over two. Yes, I'm finishing. And uh, this is also what you see in the other monkey. So we have two monkeys and the other monkeys is even better what is happening uh, in this after move period, in this resting pool period. What, is, what we see instead during the performance of the task is that the, this distribution is, uh, let's say, super critical. So you cannot have very large events. So they are very localized, maybe sparse, but are localized. They, they are not able to, these events are not able to involve all the multi electrode array. Okay, so we, we are exactly seeing what we are expecting from the simple model of single cell assembly and also for a, a spatial model like the one described, uh, introduced by, by Miguel this morning. And, uh, and we have the, 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 the footprint of being around a synchronization phase transition, okay? When we are asleep, we are in the slow oscillation phase. When we are awake, we are performing, we are super critical. And sometimes I move, maybe because I'm, I want to have rest, I want to go sleep, I want to have a nap. I start to touch this critical point, but only during these phases. And we could speculate about the computational road about this, but I don't think we have time. So just, just to conclude, but what, what are this, uh, 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 this sharp upward transition organization uh, when we are looking at the awake animal during this resting period? Well, the similarities between slow wave activity and uh, uh, awake activity, actually, when you are in this period is uh, even more apparent because you see that actually these uh, sharp upper transition are organized as waves. So whenever you have an avalanche in this period, actually you have a wave of activation, which spread starting from the blue region towards the, the red regions. So these are waves. So this is the beginning of the slow wave activity. I'm touching this ghost state, let's say, you see? And this is a, a snapshot of this traveling wave. And uh, again, to conclude, we, we performed this, uh, uh, we, we, we investigated the, the, the mechanism underlying this transition, relying on a large scale spiking neural network simulation, very similar to the one described by Egidio. And we, we, we placed our system in these two different phases. And we were able, uh, in this, uh, we, have, we have more or less a pool of neurons, so 1000 neurons represented by circle, excitatory inhibitory with adaptation on a lattice like this. And uh, changing the, these parameters, the adaptation, the excitation, you can be able to produce slow waves, the whole task. And we emulate the resting like the activity pushing the system with an additional current. We give energy a left energy. We get energy a left energy. And whenever you are 
down, so you have a low input, actually you can observe something which is intriguing. So now I have a, having a look to the spatial organization of uh, these events, you see that in the slow wave activity in the model, you have, of course, slow waves. When you are in the whole task, so in the full asynchronous state, nothing. The, 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 the activity is bubbling in, around the fixed point, stable focus. And when you are in this resting like state in which I push and remove this input from the outside, whenever I, I have a minimum in the input here, I will start to see these jumps, boom. Okay, these jumps, if you look at them, are exactly traveling waves in which the wavefront of uh, activation moves across the, 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 the lattice. And uh, again, you can recover this uh, power loss of the, uh, the, the size of uh, the avalanches. But what is more important in my opinion, because it's telling us something about the, the mechanism is this last picture. Look at what I'm, so I, I described this a few, few minutes ago. So this, uh, the, the, grain, the, the, gray, the green curve is the multi-unit activity associated averaged across the small avalanches and the purple is large avalanches. We do the same in model and we have exactly the same behavior. So whenever the network is very active before these events, the jump will be small. So the avalanche will be small. Whenever it is at rest some way, uh, just in somehow before these events, actually the, the events will be large. Why? Why? Because there is adaptation. Adaptation is an important player because adaptation is self-inhibition, but it is history dependent. So whenever you are fatigued, you will be not able to produce large events. You are le less excited. But if you are at rest, you have a lot of resources and then you can react very lot to fluctuations, okay? And so there is actually the opposite relation emphasized by, by Lucilla, because we have exactly the opposite. If the network is uh, at low activity, you have a jump, big jump. So I, I don't think that the fluctuation dis dissipation uh, condition is, uh, is working here, let's say. And the, let, let me finish with, with the conclusion. So what we found are traveling waves of multi-unit activity uh, onsets in the promoter cortex. Uh, these are the first time we, we, we see something like that in this uh, uh, experimental condition. Such waves have uh, a scale-free avalanche whenever you are performing a model decision, provided that you are looking only at the period in which the animal is not performing. So the performance requires uh, energy, uh, a, a deterministic, almost deterministic system. And uh, eventually we highlighted the possibility that we are in a synchronization phase transition and that the activity dependent adaptation is an important player in order to describe this kind of system. Uh, let, let me tell, all, uh, thank all the people involved in this journey and uh, thank you, thanks to you for the patience. Thank you, Maurizio. We have time just for one short question because we are going very long. May, Is it I, may, may I just say something very quick, uh, Andrea? Yes, of course, Lucilla. Uh, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for the nice talk. I just want to stress that uh, the, the, what the theorem teaches you is that uh, you must consider the correlation function, not the level of activity. So you can have also a, a low level of activity, but you should look at the temporal uh, correlation function, which is kindly of different, not necessarily you, you might have you know, high level of activity completely decorrelated. So you have, you know, uh, very small correlation function. So, mm, just to specify. No, no, I, I, I fully understand, but the, I want only to stress the fact that actually when, when the brain is working because it is performing some task, it is uh, uh, thinking actually is uh, out of equilibrium. It's out of equilibrium because uh, it's out of equilibrium by itself, but also because the environment outside is changing. And, I, perfectly, uh, I perfectly agree, and indeed we take this into account. Okay, so, uh, we, are, we are on the same track. <laughs> we implement a formalism that is holds for out of equilibrium systems. These are not uh, the fluctuation dissipation relation you have in standard uh, statistical mechanics textbook. 
Uh, this is a formalism that has been developed by Vulpiani, Zannetti, Letizia Cugliandolo, a number of people in the context of uh, out of equilibrium systems, uh, glassy systems, and so on. So uh, we treated the brain as an out of equilibrium system. There is no doubt about it. Okay, just very, very short, uh, Gideon, because we are late. If you go back one or two slides where you showed the small here, you showed the small circuit of excitator and inhibitor neurons. Yeah. Maybe this uh, is hinting 